Hi everyone, this is Tara Zuthawad and welcome to another episode of To You Thou Talks. Today we have the iconic Yasmin Lari. Yasmin Lari is the first woman architect in Pakistan. She's best known for her involvement in the intersection of architecture and social justice. And since her official retirement from the architectural practice in 2000, her UN-recognized NGO, the Heritage Foundation, Pakistan has taken on humanitarian relief work, as well as historical conversation projects, con conservation product projects in rural villages all across Pakistan. So now let's meet the amazing, iconic Yasmin Lari. Hello, Dara. Hi. How are you, Yasmin Sahaba? I'm doing well, thank you, Tara. You told and me you made yourself are doing such amazing work in the humanitarian field. So it's really, you know, it's pretty good to see young people doing this, actually. So congratulations. Well, thank you. But you are definitely one of the biggest inspirations for all of us. <laughs> but it's really wonderful to uh, spend this time with you because we've actually spent some time doing work together, both um, when you were Ladies Fund Lifetime Achievement winner of the year, then you've been a ladies fun judge, then we've done our food rations work, and then uh, all the stuff that we, um, it's an honor and amazing and inspiring for me to learn from you, collaborate with you, and now today share you, because you're like a very special person close to my heart. <laughs> Thank you, Tara, that's very kind of you. But yeah, it's been wonderful working with you. You're doing some amazing work too, so that's great. Thank you. So first of all, today's your spotlight, and we have called this from prima donna to barefoot architect, and more accurately, how the prima donna became the barefoot architect. So I, along with everyone else here, is dying to know. But before we go into prima donna mode, can you describe yourself in three words? Oh, very difficult to say that. Well. I call myself an architectural historian and also a humanitarian worker. And of course, I'm an architect. So I guess this is some in total of all that I am. Yep. And also heritage conservationist, actually. Yeah. So there we are. There we are. Great. And when you say prima donna, to you, what does that mean? Prima donna. But on the other hand, um, you know, I, as you know, I really. I'm fighting against this, you know, work that architects do for the one percent in the world, and you know, everybody who's wealthy. That's what architects feel that they are. They have to work for, and I, I find it really now very distasteful to have that kind of uh, an image. And so, in a sense, I was a prima donna architect at one time, and I gave it up. And I'm just very happy that I'm walking barefoot now. So it's a different way of living, a different different way of working. It's a different way of thinking uh, as to what you need to do. So I think that most architects now have to start thinking as to how they should also start changing because the world is changing. I mean, the world is now very different from what, you know, when I got trained as an architect. Today, there's a whole lot of climate change issues. There's migrants of all kinds, you know, the uh, climate uh, migrants. They are the people who are displaced because of conflict. And uh, architects have to now remember that, you know, they were really trained to serve humanity and somehow we forgot about it and veered towards the one percent. And uh, so now my mission is to say, let's forget about them. Let's look at the other side. So that's why walking. That's why walking. Yeah. Okay, amazing. So when I hear the term prima donna, I was thinking that you were describing yourself as a snob. But what you meant was that you were serving the one percent in your architecture work. And I want to Yes. I mean, you know, because architects generally, when we are, when we are trained, uh, we develop huge kind of egos and we think that, well, you know, the God, basically God's gift to earth. And so uh, most, most of them are quite insufferable. I was, I was definitely. So I'm just very happy that I, I uh, you know, left it. I, I changed course and I think I'm a much happier person. I think I'm probably a better human being also. 
Okay, so you have to share some story with me about you being insufferable because ever since I've known you, you have been yeah. kind, um, yeah. generous with your attitudes and so down to earth and you're like a rock in my life. Like when I SOS you, you're there. When I need something, you're there. You're such a rock. It's like the opposite to me is prima donna. So you have to describe the old insufferable you. Well, I think, you know, um, because architects are supposed to really, I mean, I mean, when we are trained, we think that we are next to God, actually, I have to tell you this, because whatever you create is something fantastic and everything is iconic and must be something that changes the world uh, and so on and so forth. And so you begin to think that n nothing could be done without you. And uh, of course, when I used to be, um, you know, working on any commission and people wanted changes, I would just say, no, I'm sorry, it can't be done because, you know, it'll just change my whole concept and I cannot have it being destroyed. So a lot of people listen to me, I have to say, and that's very kind of them. So I managed to get away with a lot of things that, you know, usually would be very difficult. And um, yeah, so I, I think I had a good time. I enjoyed myself uh, sort of dictating what I thought must be done uh, and so on. So, but I think now now the whole thing is different because now I believe in co-designing, co-creation, co-working, and it's a different way of life altogether and a different way of thinking, as I said. No, that's, that's incredible. But when you talk about a barefoot architect, is that your way of like the way Jamie Oliver calls himself the naked chef, you know, bare bones? Or do you actually mean the first thing you do is take off your shoes and get grounded? I mean, I know you're being facetious, but I'd love to hear it from your own sensibility and your own words. You know, this was last year, actually, sometime much long before COVID-19 and so on. I was giving this keynote at, in, uh, in Vienna. There was the Vienna Biennale and they were holding this particular conference this was about healing the planet and you know i was talking about my barefoot social architecture and somebody in the audience sort of asked me said you know what do you mean by barefoot i mean they could not even fathom what it meant and i said well you know um, it's uh, really because today um, my fellow travelers are the ones who are walking barefoot and so i feel you know i need I, I, there's a kind of empathy with them and uh, what i do today is also for them so uh, and then also because if you're walking barefoot then you're walking very uh, very softly on the planet you know you tread really softly so you don't really hurt anything as you go along so walking barefoot has a lot of advantages and my barefoot social architecture actually uh, stems from that that what you do is something which will be useful and be, you know socially uh, appropriate for a majority of of the people at the same time you will not hurt the planet i mean that's something very important as well so social justice and ecological justice go hand in hand and that's why walking barefoot is very necessary and what was that moment there had to have been that moment when you made that decision to transition something must have happened do share mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I don't know whether it was, you know, such a kind of uh, sudden lightning that uh, that struck me, but I think it was really, um, um, you know, when the earthquake struck in, in 2005. And that was, I think, a, a kind of really life-changing experience for everybody who had gone through. I mean, you were too young to even know what went on there at that time, it was 15 years ago. But, um, you know, just seeing what happened and how it happened and meeting with people who uh, suffered through that. And, you know, there were families and women particularly who'd lost their children because I don't know whether you remember or, or, or know that there were uh, lots of school buildings that collapsed. And so uh, it was a terrible, terrible thing that happened. And you suddenly realize that, you know, in a moment, in a flash, everything just goes, it's, it's gone before you know it. And uh, I think it, it taught me a lot of lessons and particularly the generosity of people of this country, people who have nothing, the poor ones, because, you know, whenever we would go to them and they would just, uh, whatever they could do, uh, you know, to be, to, to show their hospitality, they would bring a rickety kind of a table or a charpai, they will put up the, you know, the, the cloth that may be torn on it, the most beautiful one they had, and then they would serve us tea and world food program biscuits and eggs. That's all they had and they served it to you because, you know, they thought you'd come to help them. So you learned a lot about humanity, you know, from, from people like those who'd actually gone through this terrible traumatic experience. And uh, yeah, and it was, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, if you go through it, you cannot stay the same, you, you know, just 
it is life changing absolutely and you're very lucky if you get these experiences also but unfortunately in pakistan as we know uh, uh, you know every year we'd had disasters i mean there was either an earthquake or floods for the longest time and now too you see with climate change what's going on i mean uh, urban flooding and flooding elsewhere this is it's a it, disasters are all over the place so you need to see how to tackle all that and it's it's overlaying ecology environment the climate all on top of your architectural background and training that makes it a very sort of relevant and interesting body of work that you lead here for me you know a lot of times we you know because uh, uh, we are we feel that we are educated and you know we have a privileged background we've not really bothered to look at our uh, vernacular traditions and what people know and what people do and how they survive with very little uh, this is something that's you know never occurred to me when i was practicing as an architect there's nothing that i thought i could learn from them and now when i go and i meet with them and i'm with them i'm learning all the time it's just amazing how much there is for them to teach you uh, but for that you have to make sure that you have lost your ego otherwise i don't think you'll be able to learn so uh, I'm very lucky that I managed to, you know, lose my ego and and uh, at a time when I could be a part of, you know, their lives and be learning from them. That is such an incredible takeaway from one of our nation's greatest disasters and and traumas, to have come away with a lost ego but a found soul and a better understanding, and a more beautiful, richer journey. So. Uh, congratulations for that and people watching today are making comments like about the courage that is taken that it takes to make that transition so I thank you on behalf of all for that I know that when we have traveled around in interior sin little children come up to us and they teach us about hospitality the the level of warmth is unbelievable and it resonates with such unguarded unfiltered purity and also i think the way women are you know i mean i never realized how strong uh, women are just about everywhere the only thing is that they need uh, they need somebody to just kind of you know encourage them to do things and right now women are my greatest allies everywhere i mean this i learned again uh, with the work I did in the earthquake area from 2005 to we were there until just about, uh, you know, when the uh, floods happened in 2010. So, um, uh, and then of course there were floods uh, in, in Sindh as well. And then later on, as you know, 2013, there was a, an earthquake in Avaran and then again, there were floods and then again, an earthquake in the Northern areas. So really, you know, almost everywhere, all over Pakistan, you, you just had these disasters and how people who have nothing and they're the most vulnerable ones, how they manage to rise up. And the women particularly, you know, if you give them a chance, how much they do, they're the ones who then lead and uh, they've been my allies. They're the ones who have really gone forward and done things, whatever I've, I've asked them to do. So I'm just a great believer in, in their power and their strength and their commitment to do things. Uh, it's quite, yeah, it's quite, uh, quite uh, an eye opener for I think for most people or should be because people think women are not able to do very much in Pakistan, you know, and here they are. So it's not only the ones that are educated who have the all the opportunities, but even the ones that have had nothing, totally non-literate with really poor health and, you know, something like 12 or 13 children. I mean, and they are able to do a lot of things. So I think we need to just keep faith in, in them and do as much as possible for them. And that would be something wonderful. And you are doing that, Tara. You are, you're really doing a lot for women. So that's, again, something that's very important. That's very good. Thank you so much. But I am in such awe with the way you transitioned your life. Because, I mean, I'm a continually evolving creature myself, as you know. And um, it's, it's a powerful journey. And I'd love to share and learn a bit about you as a little girl. Were you unapologetically ambitious were you a little mini prima donna describe little yasmin <laughs> it was such a long time ago tara you can't you know, you, i can't be expected to you know remember all those things that were so you know far back in, in memory uh but yeah you know as you know i mean all of us are very privileged we all have really lives which are 
uh, you know, I mean, I, I don't think we all have the right to really enjoy so much as we did uh, or we do even do, you know, uh, certain classes even in Pakistan today. And uh, that was the same with us and family. Uh, we were we were really, really um, insulated from everything around you. So you led a life which I think was a little bit uh, artificial also. And uh, um, because my father was an old ICS officer, which was the Indian Civil Service, so he was highly anglicized as well. And uh, I had the good fortune of a mother who was very strong. She was uh, very kind of religious and really conservative. But on the other hand, she wanted to show that she could be uh, the, you know, the appropriate wife for, for an ICS officer. She learned to do everything from learning to speak English, to driving a car later on, to uh, riding a horse, to going hunting with my father. And you name it, and she did it because she, she could not let her side down. And uh, so we were very lucky, my whole family, my two sisters and my brother and myself, that we had these parents who really brought two different kind of you know, streams into our lives. And uh, um, I think that probably did us uh, did us good. It, if it had been only one, it might not have been so good. So uh, yeah, so it, it's a, it was a, yeah, it was very comfortable, happy life, which I, as I said, I think when I look back, it was a bit artificial because it had nothing to do with how Pakistan was or how people were around us. So I don't know whether that was the best thing for us. I'm not so sure. So, you have siblings who've done extraordinary things as well. So clearly your parents were doing things very differently. And so one, you've commented a little and shared a little bit about that, but is there any things they did that you really thought shaped you in a very special way? And I know you have two wonderful children and a grandchild as well. And is there any part of that that you take with you or have you developed your own style, a barefoot style? of uh, yeah, raising yeah. children. Yeah, I think that my life has been divided into many different segments, I feel, when I look back. And uh, of course, uh, I think both my father and mother were very encouraging. It was a long time ago, you must remember, we are talking, I mean, when I was growing up in Lahore, uh, this was in the, in the 1950s. Uh, we went to England, uh, both, actually, both my sisters and my brother, myself, all of us, in I think it was 1956. Uh, when we were still very young and, and uh, my two sisters were in school and so on. And they had a lot of confidence in us and they all, they never uh, really sort of somehow discriminated you know, between girls and boys uh, in the sense that they wanted, you know, all of us to do well and to study as much as possible. And uh, so um, I just remember that there was a lot of encouragement. My mother, who had, had knew nothing about music, my father was very fond of music. And she especially got us to learn to, you know, play the tabla and the harmonium, and I could play the sitar. And my sister Nasreen Jalil, whom, whom you know well, the senator, she uh, she sang very well, and and so on. So um, in that way, we had a very uh, a very kind of unique kind of a lifestyle, which I don't think many many families in those days had. Uh, and and that was wonderful for us because I think it let us grow in our on our own pace and thinking as what we did and so on and so forth. So yeah, it was it was extraordinary. And when you take that to your own children and now your grandchild, what what things do you do you take from that that are must dos when you were raising your children when they were younger? And what are new things that are your barefoot way of doing things? Yeah, I think you know they they all went to very good schools. They all went to America as it happens to U.S. and and so on and. Uh, uh, my daughter went to Bryn Mawr and then she went to University of Chicago. My you know, the sons went to Harvard and then to Rice University. Another one went to Chapel Hill and they all did very well indeed in their, in their studies. They decided to stay back in America. So in a sense, I've lost them because now I, of course, they're very close to me and we are discussed and so on, but they're not here with me. And uh, that's what I miss most actually, because in the work that I'm doing today, um, I know that you know it would be would have been very nice if any one of them was here, but then everybody has their own lives and they're happy what they're doing, so they are far away. Uh, and now with COVID-19, I feel that you know it's, everybody gets even further away. We don't know when we see each other, what happens. But then uh, Zooms and the Skypes and all the this technology of this world are bringing us all closer together as well in many ways. So there's more interaction, there's more discussion, and so on. But uh, yeah, but I, I do miss them very much, yes. And 
you were the first, get this everybody watching today, the first female architect in the nation's history. So that is obviously a, a great honor and a great achievement, but it's also a very interesting choice, particularly for that time. And I know there has to have been a story behind why did you want to become an architect? How did you become an architect? What was it like becoming an arch, studying and becoming an architect and being the only woman in the room? You know, I've spent so much of my life being the only woman in so many rooms and so many spaces, especially in my finance work, that um, what was it like for you, this journey? And describe why you did it. <laughs> Well, first of all, of course, I had nothing to do with being the first. I just went for my studies. I came back and, you know, suddenly found that there were no other women architects who'd been trained until that time. There were some that might have been studying, but nobody had got graduated so far. But there were really very few architects, uh, even men architects were not that many. Maybe there were a dozen of them, you know, who we could say they were qualified. There were lots of people who called themselves architects, but they were not necessarily qualified ones. That is the distinction. And um, I don't know, I just, um, I, there's no reason for me to have become an architect actually, because, except for my father, who uh, at a very young age had been interested with these tremendous responsibilities of creating, I don't know how many cities in the desert of Thal. And also he was chairman of Lahore Improvement Trust. So he was, you know, basically refashioning Lahore in the image of, of again, an Anglophile because he, he wanted, you know, European kind of styles with everything like Gulberg and Samanabad and these kind of places. And he would always come back and he used to travel a lot. Uh, uh, there were long distances, but he would come back and he would say, well, you know, there is this really Pakistan is just now emerging and now we need to have, to have a lot of professionals, particularly architects and planners. So somehow that stuck with me. And when I went to England, uh, we, we really went there to just to go to school, basically. And I decided that, you know, yes, I wanted to take it up. So I go to the first school of architecture in London and uh, and they said, well, young lady, where's your portfolio of drawings? And, you know, and I was not even 16 at the time. So and they said, well, you know, you're far too young to actually start your your uh, studies here, but you must go and, and go to a school of art, which was a very good advice. So I studied art for two years and uh, then I got admission for architecture and then I, I really enjoyed it somehow. I never thought I never knew what it really meant. And two years in England and studying art really, you know, prepared me for that. And uh, at that time, I think when I first started, there were maybe only three of us, three or four girls in there. And uh, there were two of us foreigners and maybe two English women. And by the time, you know, I graduated again, there may be just one or two uh, English, uh, you know, girl students. So it was not a profession that was really popular among women even at that time. But uh, but this is true for all professions. And I think women are now making their mark, their, their voices are being heard. And I think the time has come now for all of us to make sure that we also provide as much support as possible to the younger ones as well, because we've got to bring them up. And uh, there's still lots of hurdles, uh, I think, for women. But I have to tell you, Tara, that I really had a very comfortable life. I, um, you know, I had a lot of, first of all, there was the whole family support that I had. My parents, of course, my husband, Suhail, who had uh, studied modern grades at Oxford. And uh, he was there. And then my kids also, were, you know, really were supportive all the way. Uh, but also generally, people were very protective. Uh, I did not feel and I did not really um, feel the crunch until much later when I started to fight for certain causes. One was to get architects being registered and being, you know, get a, uh, a legal kind of protection to the to the uh, you know term architect. Uh, PCAT P was formed. I managed to get it done, but that was a real battle because there were a lot of people who didn't want it to happen. And then later on in the 90s, uh, also I, I wanted to have this law for heritage uh, to be passed, and that too I got lots of threats at that time. So those were, those were the, the certain periods when it was really distasteful. People were really really nasty. Maybe they wouldn't have been so if I was a man architect, but because I was a woman, I, 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 you know, got all that. But then, you know, because of the family support, because people know you generally, I mean, you know, how privileged people live in this country. I mean, everybody knows everybody. So it wasn't such a big deal. I think I had a fairly easy life as a woman architect. Yeah. Well, I can totally relate because especially when we had recognized Mali Yousafzai and had brought Shazia and Kanat, the two girls who were shot alongside her from SWAT who had been ignored by the world, to Karachi. 
that was when we started to get death threats. And that's when a whole different style of women empowerment or helping women, it became very real in a different way. When we saw that there's so much behind the scenes and so much texture that um, when you're feeling privileged and from, you know, sort of a prima donna stance, helping people is totally different when when you realize some people don't want you to do something. Yeah. So I, I can imagine the, the advocacy work you did, even with our food rations. Do you know there was people against the food rations that we're still doing today? It's, it boggles the mind because especially when you think to do these things, you never realize, like, would anyone oppose something that seems so no-brainer? Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, are, if if you are kind of remote and nobody knows you, but as, as soon as you become a little prominent, I think you have to face all those things. And uh, the more you do, the more, of course, you'll get it. But in any case, I think one has to do what, what one must do. So uh, that's all right. I think you just have to carry on, and uh, everybody, everything just you know falls away on the on the, in the process. And uh, yeah, you should have your you know path clearly cut out, and then. You can make it, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you yourself have a very playful, fun side and approach. Like even the way you name this talk, it, it wasn't, you're not a dead duck. You know, there's a lot of, of passion and fun and playfulness to you. Even the barefoot side of you is, is humble and sweet, but it's also playful. And I'm, I'm just wondering when you enter this man's or not even I mean, this architectural world that was new and then other areas you've gone into in life trailblazing. How do you sort of reconcile your persona being such a professional? Because you have a very professional persona, but you also have this very endearing, playful side to you. And how do you balance those two? Well, obviously, you know, if you're a trained uh, professional, then you have to every time do the right thing. And also, I think somehow um, you know being the first one also carries a lot of responsibility so uh, you feel that you cannot let the side down so you everything must be done absolutely correctly and also somehow the training uh, all my life has been uh, that you have to behave with integrity and you know whatever you do must be done uh, you know as well as you can and, and and so on and so forth so that's been there that is something that is you know given you've got to carry on but i think at some point in time i i stopped taking myself seriously and that probably happened when I had given up architecture. And I, I suddenly I saw that, you know, I used to talk a lot about heritage and I thought, you know, people like me are the only ones who know about it. And we did something called Caravan Karachi, which was, I don't know whether you know about it, but it was a totally um, voluntary effort where lots of very eminent people of Karachi came together and we used to hold these uh, events uh, in front of historic buildings. And there were thousands of people who would gather. This was way back in 2001 and two. And uh, I suddenly realized that, you know, there are all these people who we don't think much of in the sense that, you know, they're of different class, but they were all equally interested in heritage. And it suddenly occurred to me that, you know, whatever I had thought uh, really didn't make any sense anymore because there are people who really are interested in seeing, you know, what their legacy has been. And, uh, and I think that sort of, you know, and then, of course, with the work in the, in the earthquake area and meeting people, I think it, it just uh, you know makes you much saner as a person, and and so it's it's good not to take oneself too seriously. Well, that's for sure. And if you try, the world won't. So it's kind of better to give up early on that, right? Yeah. But um, talk also about um, what stage in your career or life did you marry? Your husband's, of course, Oxford educated. So you've married a very interesting, dynamic person. Your children are so educated. How did you balance that? So how did you meet him as well as how did you find the time and the ability to raise such successful, uh, achievement-oriented, good children while also doing so much work. And every day or every few days, I'm at PSO House as a director. And when I go up that long elevator ride, I always say, wow, this was created by Yasmin Lari. You know, it's just incredible. That's where I came from right now. And it's oh, your baby oh. that I, I'm in almost every day. <laughs> okay, okay. Right, right. I'm afraid um, it's not a very interesting story because my husband happens to be my first cousin and uh, we had been brought up knowing each other for the longest time. Uh, uh, his father uh, was my father's elder brother 
and uh, so we knew each other and the uh, time came when it was decided that we should get married so we did while we were both studying and uh, uh, so that was okay and then my daughter was born in Oxford actually and uh, so we just learned to help each other to be able to do things and that's how the kids were raised and uh, um, and yeah and they all took their studies seriously they you know they did a good job and uh, what's important is for them to be happy and you know and stay and do what the thing that they want to do so uh, I don't know whether uh, I had much to do with their upbringing I let them be most of the time I don't think I was such a good mother I have to tell you because I was constantly uh, you know preoccupied with my my designs this is what architects do actually most of the time because they, they keep on dreaming of whatever they're doing even you know while they're sleeping so you're never away from your work and that's the worst thing uh, about being an architect. But they all bore with me and they seem to be okay. They survived me. Yeah. They seem to be quite extraordinary. And I know that your role in that, you're just um, underplaying right now. It's, it's quite amazing how you, you, you have it all and done it all. And it's just beautiful. Can you talk a little bit about Heritage Foundation? and how, how that came to be. I know obviously heritage is at the core of it and things inspired you, but how did you put it together? How did you transition? And what exactly does it do? Okay, so, uh, you know, I, I, and I, you know that I went to England to study and I came back and I really not, didn't know very much about my own country because you were so, as I said earlier, I was so insulated that we had no idea uh, what the country was all about. And so we came back, uh, uh, you know, my husband, and myself, and we decided to go around uh, looking at old towns because I wanted to learn about them. I'd never known about them. And uh, so there was a lot of uh, traveling. Uh, we went around Lahore and Multan and Peshawar and all these cities. And it was an eye opener as to, you know, what it was because it was an amazing uh, wealth uh, on a treasure trove that you know I had not known about. So I call it my unlearning phase when I had to stop thinking as to what I had been taught in, in, in the UK and what was needed to be done in the country as Pakistan was. And I think that opened up my eyes and I looked at heritage much more deeply. So it was around 1980 that we actually established uh, um, Heritage Foundation. Uh, it was a family trust that we actually created for doing the work because uh, I wanted to concentrate particularly on cities. Karachi had not been uh, taken care of. Everybody thought that because it was British period, so it was probably not something that we had to worry about. But I'm very happy that now, uh, you know, the view is quite different after Karwan and after books that we've written and they've come out. So basically it was established to do more research uh, on heritage. And uh, at that time, my husband was running the insurance company that was the family, um, um, uh, you know, family company, and he was the uh, he was the ex uh, chief executive of that. And then, of course, as you know, uh, this whole thing happened during Mr. Putto's time when everything was nationalized, particularly the 22 families. And so, um, at that time, uh, of course, uh, he could not really run it for some after some time, and so he he sold it and he became a, a writer. He's a scholar now. He writes he writes he's a historian. He writes books. So uh, Heritage Foundation just continued to uh, document more things. We published a lot of things. And uh, then, of course, 2005, uh, this happened, the earthquake happened. So we veered into the humanitarian field. And for me now, um, learning from heritage is very important. What I do today in humanitarian field is something that I, I draw very much on vernacular traditions and the materials that are there. And then on the other hand also, I'm now taking a lot of lessons from my humanitarian work into the conservation field, because I feel Pakistan has such an enormous wealth of, uh, of heritage that we cannot actually save it if we keep on spending so much money on just one or spend two or three years on just conserving one monument. So I've designed something, I've, I've devised another way of doing it, which is that you provide emergency uh, intervention uh, and you save it for at least maybe 15, 20 years. And then when the time comes and there's more money available, you can save them. Otherwise, a lot of our monuments actually and our heritage is disappearing without us even knowing it. So uh, that's what it is now. Heritage Foundation does conservation work. We've done a lot of work in Makli particularly. That's a very special uh, site for us. It's a World Heritage Site. And I would recommend to everybody who's watching 
that I show, please go and visit Makli. Uh, it's an extraordinary place and you won't find it anywhere else in the world. And um, uh, Suhail, my husband, has written quite a few books on that. We've done a lot of documentation. We've conserved about five monuments there in the last few years. And now, of course, our Makli, uh, the Makli beggars are the ones that we are concentrating on as well. So Heritage Foundation does th both these things, but it draws very much, uh, you know, for our humanitarian work, we draw very much from, from the traditions and, and heritage of this country. So how did you train for that? Because you have actually trained in architecture. When you transition to heritage, how do you go about learning that? Well, even as an architect, you know, uh, there was a lot of emphasis on heritage, even as we were studying. So there was always, uh, of course, it was the European tradition that they were talking of. But I think the the, the principles are all the same. And then I had uh, this chance to work a lot with UNESCO, and especially as their uh, national advisor at the Lahore Fort, which is the World Heritage Site. And uh, um, I devised lots of different systems. Uh, through which we could uh, uh, identify each part and be able to document each part. Because in my work, I put a lot of uh, emphasis on making sure that everything is documented, what is there from before and whatever we do and what it comes out to be, everything is is there uh, you know, uh, uh, in, in our books and with photography and write-ups and so on and so forth. And uh, basically there are lots of uh, guidelines, international guidelines and their charters and uh, if you can if you follow them then you can never do the wrong thing uh, and uh, uh, what's in, important of course also is for me now is to involve communities into it because there was a time when you said only very highly skilled people or really uh, experts um, you know well-known experts should really touch a monument my feeling uh, always is and has been and now too even more is to see as many people as possible to get engaged with heritage and to take care of it. There are certain parts which you have to do very, very carefully and only professionals and experts should, should touch it. But there are so many different steps that can be taken by ordinary people as long as you train them. And as long as they feel for it and they have a commitment to 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 make sure that you, know, you do the right thing. So I think heritage should now be uh, conserved in a different manner and more and more communities must be involved. Otherwise, uh, you know, it's there and if people around them don't even know the value of it because they get nothing out of it, it will never survive. So we need to see how to involve more people into it, more people who are living around there, not just tourists. Tourists will not take care of these monuments. It's the people around these uh, wonderful sites that will, that, that will take care of them. So we have to change the way that we are working, that the way we conserve our, our, our uh, historic places. So that's the uh, that's the effort, and I think I'm getting some good results. I think around the world now it is being accepted that this is one way to you know to to conserve, and uh, the more we do it, the more uh, monuments or heritage sites we'll save. Otherwise, I'm afraid um, things are not so good for the country. There are lots of monuments and sites that are just disappearing. So. Thank you for all you're doing to conserve sites because it's our history, it's our legacy, it's for the children of future generations. It's it's very, very important work in addition to... Uh, I also wanted to say, and because you're a Karachiite, I want Karachiites now to come together. We have to save all the historic buildings of Karachi also because I don't know whether you know, but almost every day there are people who are gradually demolishing from inside and only the facades are remaining. And it's a terrible disaster because, you know, I'm the one who, you know, in 1996 got 600 buildings notified. We got a special law. We got them notified. And unfortunately, there has been no funding for them. So it's all disappearing. So I think as Karachi said, I would like you to now mount a campaign for this, actually. You must, you know, with all the good things that you do, uh, we have to save the heritage of this city. And all the Karachiites must come, must come together. And we shouldn't leave it to the leave government. The government. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I think it's one of the most worthwhile causes and we should run a campaign for it. And that's something we should, after this conversation, look into the logistics of starting because it's uh, horrific if such important landmarks are being destroyed from the inside. And you mentioned earlier that one of your greatest passions is Muckley. And you said it's one of the most beautiful or one of the most special places for people to see. What makes Muckley so special? Oh, Makli is so special because um, it has a, an amazing air about it. There's sort of spiritualism there when you go there because there are so many 
um, so many shrines that are also, you know, along the ridge. Uh, and there are these amazing structures which you know span from about 15th century to 17th century. So they're all there, and you can see the transition from one uh, kind of period to the other. And so many different dynasties that that you know that Sindh had that are all reflected in that. But it is, I think, one of the very rare sites, and maybe the only one, where you have a combination of intangible and tangible heritage, because you know you have the folklore, you have the the shrines you have the you know the the tamal the devotional dancing you have all kinds of things going on there and then on the other side you have these silent amazing kind of iconic buildings you know with domes and arches and and at night the the, the whole air is so different so uh it, it, you know it has this combination of so many things there and um, and there's beautiful craftsmanship there if you see um the, the stone uh, buildings are all carved you won't find a single part of it that is left without being carved. And uh, that is a tradition that, you know, starts off with the Hindu uh, carvings. So you have an amalgam of the two of them. And then there's Kashi, the, you know, the gray style work, again, amazing geometric designs. And, you know, we had the chance to, um, to uh, restore uh, uh, the tomb of Sultan Ibrahim, where US Ambassador's Fund was, uh, you know, kind enough to give us a grant. And uh, again, we learned how to do kashi, and that kashi is now being transferred to villages. We are teaching our beggar women how to make kashi and terracotta work, which is, work, which is what, what is kashi? Kashi is, uh, is glazed tiles, glazed ceramic tiles. So that's a very special craft of Sindh. You have it in Punjab as well, but uh, a Sindh one is also very, very special. So we had to learn it, and UNESCO helped us in that. We acquired that whole thing from, you know, looking at the traditional ways of doing it. And now the same craft is being transferred to women. Now, women had never had been allowed to actually participate in this. It's the first time that women are doing it. And as I said, they're doing a superb job of it. So they can now make these beautiful terracotta ornaments and all kinds of things that are selling all around themselves. Because I do feel that any craft that is there, it will only survive if it remains within communities, the moment we say it's only for the high end, I think you've lost uh, the soul of it. So the more we can spread in villages so that this is where it, it used to be, all, all kinds of crafts, and that would be just amazing because then everybody knows they can use it and it's theirs. So they have a sense of ownership. Well, that's very important. And when we look at um, the work you're doing from beggars who've turned entrepreneurs, we recognize first with uh, your nomination, a beggar who turned an entrepreneur, and then we recognize later a beggar who turned entrepreneur who was training other beggars to become entrepreneurs. A classic entrepreneurial um, pyramid structure model. How did that all come about? I know that, how did the vision come to you? How did the execution come about? It's, it's a whole different world than basic architecture. Well, I... <laughs> You know, I've given up architecture, as you know, so now I can, you know, I can explore all kinds of other fields and how to do things. Uh, of course, the training does help, but I think I'm more into trying to see how um, how we can mobilize people to be able to um, learn, not only sharing of knowledge, but also empower them. And uh, this is what's happening. So we have, uh, I have this whole barefoot social architecture model, which is, talks about uh, the barefoot ecosystem. Because if you, I mean, you know very well, I don't have to tell you that, you know, there's something like 100 million people who will be below the poverty line in Pakistan, uh, you know, post-COVID situation. So that means majority possibly are the poor ones, not the ones who are well off and so on. And uh, so um, my attempt always has been how to scale up. And I've not been very successful because we've not been able to do much except for maybe, but, you know, what is about, about 3,000 units we've built in terms of shelters and so on. So that's about 300,000 families, uh, 300,000 people. But um, the point is that it's a drop in the ocean. We have to do much more. So this barefoot uh, social architecture actually aims to do that, which is also which takes care of your cultural roots. It talks about environment, talks about, you know, uh, techniques and so on and so forth. And the whole, um, the whole emphasis is that the poor must make products for the other poor because uh, there are so many unmet needs of the poor that have never been met because governments are not 
their poor governance, all kinds of, you know, what the issues are. So the poor don't have the thing that they want. And if other poor can make those products, then, you know, if they're reasonably uh, priced and if they're good quality, then why would they not sell? So we trained about 230 beggars last year, 2019. We got a grant from the British Council for uh, Creative Industries and uh, we trained them into green skills and also into crafts. And 70% were above the poverty line in February of uh, this year before COVID. And even during COVID-19, the lockdowns, there was something like 40% who were able to earn. So local, locally produced, local materials, locally marketed. Because I've told them, I said, don't worry about the rich. They are not going to even look at you. Why should you bother? You just go and sell among yourselves. And they've done it. So there's a huge potential. And my woman, as you know, the Pakistan Chula, uh, this uh, Champa and her husband, Kanji, who uh, out of 60,000, 30,000 have been uh, made because of their uh, uh, entrepreneurial skills, because they go around and teach people. They don't make them. And uh, they've earned, uh, as you know, Champa well, she was one of your uh, winners, actually. So, and now she earned in four years, 60 lakhs of rupees. So, and you, you see how she comes, fully attired with her silver jewelry from, uh, you know, from <laughs> wrist to up to the elbow and so on. So there's a huge potential. These are my barefoot entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Champa is extraordinary, as are you. And uh, I call her Champa Chula, <laughs> you know, cause she's just, she, when I think of a chula, a chula is a pot for those people watching who don't know what it is, a cooking pot, uh, a stove where you cook, a stove. And um, Champa's story is extraordinary. And of course she's a ladies fun winner. And she even came to our legacy luncheon last year celebrating 10 years worth of winners. And when she walks in a room, she's got it. She's someone who's changing the world around her. And she's just one of those, those women who is transforming her world and that around her. And she comes in her whole, um, as she said, um, bracelets up to here and, you know, the whole works. And an extraordinary person who's entered my life thanks to you and uh, is, is, is great inspiration. But as you went about this, you talked about lockdown and COVID. Right before lockdown, you were in London and you were invited over by Prince Charles of the Royal Family of the UK, who invited you to his house, Clarence's house, for a cup of tea. And it was supposed to be 15 to 20 minutes, but he just wouldn't let you go. So you ended up bonding so much. You just, I mean, you just got along so well that you ended up staying almost an hour together. Can you tell us a little bit about how that came about and, and what it was like for you and, and what, how you bonded and what you spoke about? Whatever you can say that is. Yeah. Well, it is very kind, actually, and uh, yeah. Initially, of course, the meeting was very sh was to be very short, but gradually, I, I found that they, they had allocated more time, uh, and uh, so on. And uh, uh, I I'd, I'd met him actually um, a couple of years ago. Uh, uh, I'd been invited to give a talk at the Interbau um, Congress in London, and uh, he'd been watching our work, especially with zero carbon. I don't know whether you know, but he's a great proponent for you know, uh, really uh, lowering the carbon footprint and, and uh, you know, what to do about climate change impact and so on. So uh, I'd been getting sort of, you know, um, kind of uh, messages from him that he was very interested in what we were doing. And so um, uh, when I was there, uh, it was a kind of a reception on which uh, I met. And uh, he was always um, very interested in how things were going. And I, I actually opened uh, uh, this uh, an organization called Interbal, which is international uh, um, uh, something or the it's, it's a very long name, but urban, urban and traditional, traditional and urban kind of uh, um, uh, methodologies. And uh, I was asked to uh, create a, a, a chapter here in Pakistan. So I created Interbal Pakistan, and he, of course, uh, is the one who's a patron of, of uh, Interbal. And so he's always very interested to discuss uh, about, you know, what we are doing, how I'm carrying on the zero carbon. And then last year we had this very big international uh, Interval conference, Interval Pakistan conference, in which uh, lots of delegates came from all over the world and lots of chapters of Interval as well. And he was very kind. He sent us a video and the video was really, um, uh, he spoke Urdu in that as well. And he said that, uh, Makli will will show the way forward uh, now in future as to what needs to be done 
in terms of architecture and, and tradition and so on and so forth. So that was again uh, something that was very kind of him to, to say that. And then when I was in London just early this year, before COVID lockdown, as you said, uh, I'd been uh, uh, in, invited because of this uh, Jane Drew prize that they gave me. Uh, so uh, I, I was there and then I got the news or uh, got the message that he would like to have a chat. So that's how I went to Clarence House and it was really uh, very kind of him and, and very, he was very, very gracious. And uh, again, we discussed all about how to take this whole zero carbon mission forward. And of course, he's very interested in all these issues and he speaks Urdu also, you know, he says a few words of Urdu and he says inshallah and so and it's quite charming. So, and there was in, there was an Intabao executive director um, uh, who was there uh, with me and, and uh, she was there and also somebody, uh, Jeremy was there from the Princess Foundation. So uh, Harriet and, and uh, Jeremy were with me and we all sat and we had a very nice chat and to see what could be done through Commonwealth as well, because I think the whole, all Commonwealth countries are there. And uh, I think what we are talking about is something that can be useful, uh, especially the zero carbon footprint idea and climate responsive design. Uh, that is something that uh, I think uh, needs to be taken forward. And he's very keen that it should be spread so, uh, and I don't know whether I told you, but he also actually uh, provided support to us in the in Makli, where I've got my zero carbon campus. And we've dedicated actually this Intabao Center for Training uh, and Research uh, to his name because he provided support to us. Uh, and it was actually inaugurated by President of Pakistan, Dr. Alvi, uh, last, in, uh, last November. So, uh, yeah, I think there are people in the world who are really interested in, in, in doing something practically about climate change. And he's one of them, definitely. Absolutely. And your time with him, it just reminds us all what's possible and how work can evolve and who comes to join your life and collaborate. Who are your sources of strength and support in life? Well, I think uh, uh, family, definitely. I think my husband has provided me enormous support. I don't think women can actually work uh, in the outside world as it is for them unless uh, you have full support from the family because you can't be fighting at many fronts and uh, uh, so that's been something that has always been there i've uh, always uh, i mean when i wanted to go for the earthquake work first my husband said you know how can you go by yourself and you know i had nothing i had no workforce i had given up my my practice and then he saw that I was just determined. So he said, okay, so he allocated 500,000 rupees and that's all I went with in, in the earthquake area with literally nothing. And then suddenly help came from all sides. So many volunteers came so much, I cannot tell you. So it's just incredible what happens. But uh, yeah, he's, he's been a constant there. I mean, for the longest time, as you can imagine. And uh, uh, I think that is something that's that's really important. And my children also, who have always you know supported me in every way, whatever I've done, they've always you know been with me. Uh, and I think that's that's what it is really. Um, uh, there are other people also. I mean, I, I really have to thank so many. I can't tell you because on the way, it's incredible the number of people come and help you out. And I've had the good fortune where uh, you know if I was to start remembering, it would take a whole day to be able to thank everybody. So uh, it's been, yeah, it's, it's been quite amazing, uh, quite amazing. And are there times, even one time, where you actually didn't get what you wanted? And how did that sort of lead to some, something else in your life? Because it's hard for me sitting here imagining you ever not getting what you want, but it is life. Yeah, with Tara, you know, it, it's you can dream of things and you want to do things, but a lot of things, a lot of times didn't, things don't happen. We must remember that. But I've also seen that things that I wanted to do after maybe not immediately at that time, but later on, somehow it has happened. They, they've, they've, you know, they have actually act, been actualized. Um, I think you, you must keep on dreaming and you keep, must keep on wanting to do things and maybe it doesn't happen quite at that time. Sometimes you're too early also uh, from you know what has happening around you. So you have to wait. And if you have long enough life, which I've been blessed, I mean, I think every day is a bonus for me. Uh, you know, they, I seem to be seeing that those things are coming back and, you know, they are finally happening. So I don't think one should get deterred and get disheartened. I think we should just carry on, push on. 
It's the power of divine timing and when things are meant to be. And in your own life, do you, when you look at your life, are you living your dream life or do you have more dreams that you're working towards at this moment? And what would you say to those watching today trying to align their life with their dreams? Uh, uh, what I've done, I feel that I've done not done enough because the problems are huge. And what I need to do is to make sure that everybody who wants to build a zero carbon house is able to do that. So what we're doing now using technology and learning from the experience of COVID-19, we're making these video tutorials that everybody can see, watch and actually make a bamboo or a mud house. Because there was this little clip that came out of BBC that apparently has got 4.2 million hits that had actually covered the work I'm doing in Makli. So suddenly, you know, everybody wanted to, see, they wanted me to make it for them. And I said, look, I'm not a contractor. How can I do it? And I thought the best thing would be that we should just make the tutorials, put them on YouTube, then everybody can watch them and they can make them. So now I need technology to join hands with me so that we can spread it to these, you know, whatever hundred million people there are or 10 million families or whatever they would be, that everybody is able to make a safe house. So next time when a disaster happens, they are not, you know, either sort of, you know, uh, washed away or, 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 or they're collapsed. So we have to do that if we want people to have a better life. And this can be done anything. You know, once we've got the tutorials, if I've got the outreach with, with the technology, then we can teach them how to live better, how to be healthier, how to, to, you know, send children to school. How can they make products that they can sell to each other? How can they just, you know, learn how to live better? If I can do that, that would be nice. Well, obviously, there's amazing work that you're needed for. So each day is not a bonus. And so you're going to have many, many more days and years and so forth. But mm -hmm. I do know that I just heard you say that you've not done enough. And so um, while you're being modest, that I, I think that uh, you've done a lot and you're continuing to do a lot in a beautiful way and if we can think of a way to maybe combine educate a girl and your bamboo huts and maybe get you know how people go to africa and they build houses and things like that for a summer if we could find a way to get some girls to come whether local or abroad to come and build your bamboo huts that could be a very interesting dynamic and uh, globally exciting project as well as locally exciting So definitely that's something really, really exciting. What do you do when you're not barefoot? When you're wearing your high heels or your shoes, what are your hobbies? What do you do aside from all of this? I don't know, uh, Dara. My problem is that, you know, I actually gave up my, my practice to be able to write books because I was envious of Sohail who had turned into a historian. And somehow those books are still uh, at the back burner and I'm still not... Uh, able to do very much. Um, I need to work harder on that. There's still too much to be done. So, um, and as I am getting so old, so I need more rest. So I have to rest in between all the time. And I think uh, uh, probably my memory is also not, not that good anymore. So I have to think harder and work harder. But I would like to do a few books before um, I you know, pop out. So, well, so. <laughs> instead of talking about you popping on, let's say that you are, um, how do you manage your time? I, don't know. I, uh, I think, you know, with time, it's always whatever you want to do. I think one always has time. I think even the busiest people, and it's the busiest people who can find time to do the things that they really would like. So, um, uh, and I really, my children have gone, they're not here. So I really have no responsibilities with them. It would have been nice if they were here, but they're not here. So it's, uh, I, you know, I, uh, I have enough time, actually. I uh, don't think that I, you know, yeah, I don't think there's a problem. I have enough time to be, time able, to to do be able to do it. Yeah. Yeah. So. I believe that because I have an abundance of time too. So I can completely relate because when you start looking at life as the choices you choose, there's yeah. always abundance to do what you want. 
Now we normally have lots of time for audience questions, but instead of the audience questions, we have, I don't know, tons and tons of people just saying, you're my inspiration, all about you, uh, that you're so courageous, you're so impressive. So we just have all these comments that are praises and the questions people want to know is just, are you happy and is, is this, um, and they just want to thank you. And that's the most, most important thing uh, that's coming from the forum watching right now because you are such a beautiful soul, such a kind person and a complete rock. And I have to say, as we were planning and putting this together, you were more technically sound and technologically sound than so many people, how you got on this program, you were ready, you were good to go, and you're a total rock, as always, and a complete rock in my life. So I just want to thank you so much for coming on today and being the wonderful person. Thank you so much, Tara. Thank you, and thank you, everybody who's watching. I'm just very grateful. Thank you very much. So thank you for being here, and bye for now, and have a wonderful rest of your day, and everybody watching, thank you so much, too, and bye. So thank you all for watching this episode of um, Tiyu Thou Talks with Yasmin Lari. You all know her impressive resume, you know her iconic status, but now you know the beautiful soul she is and why she's one of my most favorite people and a complete rock in my life. And what I learned today, among the many, many things about because she's so amazing, was that time is definitely her superpower as well, and she knows how to prioritize. And although the amazing Yasmin Lari just said that she hasn't done enough, I think she's such an inspiration to the rest of us who are still striving to do even one millionth of what she's done in this world. Thank you for tuning in and have a great night. Bye.